13 tales told be a Dubliner, be Torlach con me. Story 9, A Life on the Run. When I was in Toronto, I was down working near the American border. I came across a fugitive from the law. There's always fellas that come up across the border, maybe after pulling a big job or escaped from some prison. I didn't know this at first, of course. I mean, about American fugitives, or about this particular fella, Frank Davis as he called himself. He was a fella that was working at the place where I was working. There were real Joe jobs, as they said. Now, this fella kept mostly to himself, and he didn't get into chats with others at lunchtime or what have you. But little by little, I got into conversation with him and gained his confidence. I remember well the look of him. He was a handsome fella, with jet black hair slicked back and an athletic build. But what you noticed most of all were his eyes. They were very sensitive eyes that seemed to register everything seen or heard. They were so alive. His eyes contrasted with the rest of him, which was muted. His manner was understated. He didn't raise his voice. He didn't laugh. When he smiled, it didn't last for long. His look was serious. He looked like he'd been through a lot. But he couldn't have been more than 35. That's where I would put him. He was a quiet sort of fella, but it wasn't just that. It was that he seemed under a cloud or a burden of some kind. There was a sadness about him. It showed in his eyes. I didn't often catch his eye, but when I did, I could see the sadness there. He had dark eyes, and they were full of sadness and they seemed to say that he could understand all the sadness in the world. It was a sympathetic look he had. Now, I've known other fellas in me time that were reserved and gloomy like he was, but you didn't want to get to know them or have much to do with them, because you knew there was no sympathy there. They were looking out for themselves, and they didn't give a damn about you or anyone else who crossed their path. Anyway... Here was a fellow who never talked about himself, and who was oddly non-committal about any other topic of conversation. Yet I liked him, and I wanted to know more about him. At least, I wanted to get to know him, and the two things seemed to be bound up together. I sat and had coffee with him once or twice on breaks, and I tried not to break down his reserve by asking questions, which I knew would only make him be evasive and withdraw. Then one day I actually had lunch with him at the canteen, as there was no one else having lunch from the work group but the two of us. We collected our trays with our meal on them, and we stopped to pay Alana the cashier. She was there at least. She was a young girl who lived in town. She knew him and she knew me, and we exchanged a few words. Then Frank and I went to a table and sat down. We talked a little bit about work to begin with. Just chit-chat. Then he said, You're from Ireland, isn't that right? That's quite right, says I. I'm from Dublin. Great city, I added with a slight smile. He returned the slight smile. I'm sure it is, he said. Do you miss it? Sure I do, I said. Then after a pause, feeling an urge for sincere confession, or perhaps just hoping to win his sympathy, I added, I miss a lot of things, but more than things I miss, it's the strangeness I hear that gets to me sometimes. It's a different country, a different society. People talk different, they react different, they think different. He was silent for a moment, as if he was weighing something in his mind. Then he spoke again. Just how long have you been over here anyway? Two years, I said. 
That's not long, he remarked. No, not all that long, I said slowly. Long enough, though, to realise how different things are here. Because when you come here first, you think how great it is, and how exciting it is, and all the opportunities you may see before you. But then you stay around for a while. The newness of it all wears off, and eventually, well, as I said, you realise how different everything really is. Under the surface, I mean. Under the surface. He was trying to sound casual, but I could tell he was interested, and he genuinely wanted to know more. On the surface, people are much the same, says I. And things work. Society works pretty much the same, though there are different names for things. He smiled. Yeah, like uh, lift and elevator, that kind of thing. Yeah, I said. But I came to realise that people are different. All people from what I expect, or, or, or had been expecting. How they tick, it's, it's different, really different. Like what? Well, people don't relate in the same way. You don't look a fella in the eye and just make a remark to him, or strike up a conversation, just because you automatically have so much in common. Back in the old country, you may be alike or you may not, but you still have a lot in common. Even the things that are different, you can read them off and then make allowances for them. But that's not the way here. When you meet people, well, you know little about the other fella, and he knows nothing about you. You have to start from scratch, as you might say. I find it hard to let go old habits. I try to allude to something that I and the other fella might have in common, and it always just falls flat. The other fella just looks at me. Whatever this game is, he's not playing. And the worst thing is, not so much that you don't know the other fella and can't begin to get to know him, but that he knows nothing about you. Nor does he expect to. Nor does he really want to. And that's the trouble. That's what weighs heavily on me soul. That being unknown and not being understood. There's no mirror to give you a reflection of yourself. It makes you feel like you're not really there. Frank Davis had lit a cigarette. He smoked like a man who needed the cigarette to calm his nerves and relax. And it looked like he wanted to relax. Is that so bad? He asked with a slight smile. I feel relieved when people don't ask me about myself and don't want to know. It means you don't have to do a lot of explaining. I suppose, I said. But that's the difference between us. I mean, your people and our people. We don't have to do a lot of explaining, because we have all that stuff in common that I talked about. You don't need to understand one another anyway. You just meet to do a job, say, and when the job is done, you part company. You take the high road and I'll take the low road, and that's it. God, I wonder that you don't feel lonely. Who? All you people over here. He drew on the cigarette. Well, don't be too sure. We get lonely sometimes too. I suppose it helps if you have a family. Yeah. Another drag on the cigarette. Eyes averted. No, I wouldn't ask him. Anyway, I haven't made much in the way of friends over here in the two years I've been. It's good to meet another lad from the old country when you do. Not that you feel patriotic or anything like that. It's just an encounter for a change that doesn't end in nothingness, like driving down a dead end. So that's what it's like when you talk to people over here, he said, smoking more meditatively now. I nodded. Do you feel that about me? he asked gently. I was glad to pick this one up, and I did. Well, you're an American, just like some of the people around here, and I'm not, of course. Mind you, there's something different again about you. Something that sets you apart. A faint shadow of suspicion or wariness crept into his eyes when I said this. Yeah, he said with a faint light tone. I'm different, eh? How am I different? Well, maybe you're just like everyone else here in that regard. And it seems strange to me. 
Americans are always pulling up sticks and moving somewhere else. Not all of you, but a lot of you. And it seems to me that you're a man with no story and no roots. You're on your way somewhere when you could come from anywhere. Am I right? He smiled broadly now, in spite of the weariness which hadn't left his eyes. I guess that's about it, he said softly. I've never managed to stay long in one place. I nodded eagerly. That's just it. The other fellows I know here, they have some kind of roots, some kind of a story, even though there's a lack of attachment to home and family that I find hard to fathom. I mean, home can be anywhere, and family is just where they happen to be. But you seem to be an extreme case. I grinned, and so did he. Nobody knows a thing about you, and you're not in a hurry to tell either. His grin faded slowly. Well, maybe there's not much to tell. He shrugged his shoulders. Oh, but there is, I insisted. You try to be the man with no name, but there's a kind of a look in your eye that tells people you care, and that there really is something to you. If you don't want anyone to notice you, you're not going the right way about it. You're not that kind of man. Well, thanks, he said, reverting to his shy smile. I have always cared about people. About the people I meet. Yeah, but you too? I thought so, I said. And that's why... Well, you seem to be almost as much a stranger in a strange land as I am. Though you're from here. An American, of course. And that's why I'd like to get to know you, if you don't mind, I added apologetically. No, I don't mind, he said heavily now. It's just that I need to be careful. About trusting people. He nodded. Look, he said, with sudden decision. You say you've been here for two years. You've never been in Canada or America before, or known much about it before you came. No, I didn't, I admitted. I wasn't what you'd call very informed. Well, if you can keep a secret, he said with his shy smile, and I think you can. I got into a bit of trouble with the law a long time ago, down in the States, and I've been lying low ever since. Oh, I see, I said. Well, that would explain why you keep moving and don't settle down anywhere. I suppose that's lonely. But I suppose there's a kind of freedom to it, even a thrill. You can go anywhere you like. Why, if you had a mind to it, you could show up your job here and go out west. You know, to the Alberta oil fields or the Pacific coast. Yeah, I've thought about that sometimes, he said. I kind of like the idea of the Pacific coast, where it starts to be spring in February, he said with a grin. These Canadian winters can be hard on me. Though I'm used to it all by now, and it's not much worse than Chicago in the winter time. I don't think I'll stay up in Canada, though. When I've had enough of this job, I'll go back stateside. Who knows, he said with another grin. Maybe I'll go out to California again. God, we said, have you been out there? He nodded. Oh, more than once, he said with a sigh. I guess I've been all over. I've seen America from coast to coast. Why not stay in Canada, then, I asked. Take the pressure off you. I take it you haven't been on the wrong side of the law up here. No, no, but it's not that. It's just that I have things to follow up in the States, and I don't like to be away for too long. It's nice being up here for a while. It does take the pressure off. Our eyes met across the table. Something told me he felt he had said too much. I was wary of pursuing things. Anyway, he had finished his cigarette. We both got up. Well, nice talking to you, said Frank Davis, with a shy smile and a sympathetic look in the eye that I knew I would treasure. I hope we'll talk again, says I. You bet. Then he was gone. Back to work, I suppose. We had coffee once or twice without getting to know each other much better. Then again, other fellows were there, and so he clammed up as I expected he would. I decided that I would pursue the matter when I got a chance. 
He had a story to tell. Well, as I come from a country where people tell stories, I thought he might tell it to me. One day we were on a late afternoon shift that went on into the night, so we had an evening meal together at the canteen. There was hardly anybody there, not even Alana, as we got our hamburgers together. It was a stranger sitting at the cash. No, Alana, this time, I said to him as we walked down the canteen. No, he said as we sat down at a table. She doesn't work nights, only during the day. I looked at him inquiringly. Alan is the daughter of Marjorie Bowker, the woman who runs the motel where I'm staying in town. Sometimes Alana helps out behind the desk at the motel, too. Oh, I see, I said. Well, he said, how are you getting on? Got to know anybody since we talked last? I shook my head. Not really. Except you. We both smiled at that. I went on. It's like I was telling you. You get to know fellas, and you don't really know them after all, and you can be as sure as shooting that they don't know you. He nodded sympathetically. No, you never get to know anyone here, I said. Not even you, though I don't blame you. I know you have a reason for not being known. Whatever sort of trouble you were in. I suppose it was a long time ago. He looked at me earnestly, as if making a decision again. How long did you say you'd been over here? Two years? That's right, I said. Well, the trouble I was in happened a long time before that, so you wouldn't know about it. Big trouble, was it? He leaned across the table. You wouldn't know about it, but it was a high-profile case in Indiana. He dropped his gaze to the table. A murder case. I shook my head. I've never heard anything about that. Was it a long time ago? It was quite a long time ago, he said, and I could tell he was relieved at my ignorance. Tell me the story, I urged him. You know, I come from a place where everybody tells stories. Sometimes you hear some really good ones. So what's yours? He looked down for a while, and then he began to talk, quietly, as if to no one in particular. In a town in Indiana, there was a doctor, a paediatrician, and his wife. They were in their early thirties, and they had no children yet. They were actually quarrelling a lot about this, because he wanted children, and even suggested adopting, but she didn't want to hear of it. In the meantime, she had started drinking. The neighbours knew all about this. Then one night, the doctor came home and went in and found his wife dead. She had been murdered. Just before he went in, he had seen a man running from the house. But afterwards, the doctor was framed for his wife's murder. A court sentenced him to death. There was a silence. Go on, I said, feeling he had not the strength to tell much more. While he was being taken by train to the state prison to be executed, something happened. A train derailment. And somehow he escaped. After that, police forces were looking for him everywhere. There was a police lieutenant who had worked on the case, and for years he pursued the man all over America. But he never caught up with him. He looked me in the eye, willing me to share his whole secret. I was that man, the man I have been telling you about. So, you're a doctor, I said. He nodded. Was, I guess. God, when did all this happen? I asked. It was in 1962, he said. But wait a minute, I gasped. That was 30 years ago. You mean you've been on the run since then? Yes, I have, he said softly. I've learned a lot on the way. Like when you can trust someone. I nodded quickly. But how can that be? I asked him. You look like a man in your early thirties. 
or mid-thirties at most. You're not old. You're not that old. I'm afraid I am, he said heavily. I just turned sixty this year. He chuckled at my astonished look. Soon I'll be able to retire, if anyone believed me. But I wouldn't dare, of course. Why don't you turn yourself in? I asked suddenly. You know there's no more capital punishment, or not much of it. At most it puts you in jail. Then I wouldn't be able to do anything. I'd lose whatever chance I have to prove my innocence. You see, I've been looking for that man I saw running away from the house ever since. And have you found him? More than once. But he always managed to get ahead of me again. I won't find him again now. The chances are he's dead. I know the police lieutenant who always pursued me is gone. He retired a few years ago in Indiana. Now he's dead. They don't have anyone like that working on the case anymore. Judge, jury, lawyers, police. All of them that were involved are dead or old now. I can't believe you're 60, I said. Don't you feel like quitting? Like settling down somewhere? They've all forgotten you or given up, it seems to me. He shook his head. No, it's still all on the books. The old wanted posters are still out there. Faded, gathering dust, in police stations and post offices, with a picture of me and interstate flight. There's no statute of limitations on murder. But don't you see? In all these years, I've had a life full of experiences I never had as a small-town doctor. You know, I was in Korea as a medic, and it was all new like that, but then it was over. That was war. I didn't want to go, but I had to, and then I really appreciated it. I still remember it. His voice was hushed, remembered it all. Then he looked up. You've never known war, have you? What about in Ireland? Wasn't there something going on over there not so long ago? Oh, that was just in the north. I'm from Dublin. No, I don't know anything about war. Well, it changes you. It changes you utterly. You're just thrown among all this chaos and danger. You didn't choose to go. I was drafted by the end of medical school. You're just trying to keep alive. And you didn't choose to go there. That's the most important thing about it. It's like being sent to hell. There's no way out. And you decide to make the best of it. Do you understand what that's like? We were thrown into the thick of it pretty quickly. I was a medic, a non-combatant, but still I was getting shot at like the rest of the unit. I saw some terrible injuries, gunshot wounds, hand grenades, landmines, you name it. I did what I could for guys, but often enough they just didn't make it. By the end of my tour of duty, I was starting to make sense of treating wounds. But then it was too late. Anyway, the casualties were usually quite heavy. The two sides were very close to one another, which meant that there was sniper fire to deal with, and of course grenades being lobbed across. I don't know what it was like on the other side for those North Koreans and Red Chinese. They must have had a rough time of it too. I think we were better equipped. We were certainly better fed. The Reds made up for it by being tricky. They were like a guerrilla army in some ways. They were always sniping from foxholes, even at night. They would lie low when we advanced, and then suddenly there would be an ambush when we'd be caught in rifle or machine gun fire. They were tricky, like I said. They knew the medics went out for the wounded between the lines. They even knew the word medic after a while, because they heard wounded guys calling for a medic from where they lay between the lines. Especially at night, one of them might start to shout, Medic! And another would take it up somewhere else. Medic! is what you'd hear coming across to you in the dark. 
Sometimes guys went out to get the wounded man, and there was no wounded man, but they were gunned down or a grenade landed among them and blew them to pieces. That's how close it was sometimes. You had to guess when there was really a wounded man out there, or whether it was a red waiting to kill you. You got used to guys you knew getting killed, or maimed, or wounded. Think of how terrible it was. A guy you knew and had just shared a drink of coffee with or something, and here he was lying, covered in blood, and you had to figure out what to do for him while he was yelling or groaning. Sometimes you caught his eye while you were doing it. Or you caught the eye of a soldier who was helping you with the stretcher, or covering for you under fire. But you know what? It felt great. I tell you, it felt great. I've never felt so good as when I was out there trying to save someone, whether I could or not. It felt glorious. I never felt like that afterwards as a civilian doctor. You know, I, I helped people. I did a lot for kids. I was a pediatrician afterwards, like I told you. It felt good to do something for them to be thanked by the parents afterwards. But it was nothing like being out in Korea. Can you understand that? Nobody else could who wasn't in Korea. You were just so alive. You felt you could do anything. On the other hand, you could be cut down at any moment by a sniper's bullet. It was the risk, the fight, that narrow space between life and death. I was alive, and I never asked for that. I only went because I was drafted, and the army said, you go there. When I saw what it was like, and what I was expected to do, I was horrified. But there was no choice. It was just do or die. And so you did. I took it and ran with it. It was nothing like I'd ever been prepared for, and I thought that kind of life would never come my way again. The trouble is that you can't undo what's happened, all you've been through. Little do you know that anything afterwards is going to be an anticlimax. It has to be, but you don't realize it at the time. Anyway, when my tour of duty was over, I was just glad to get home in one piece. It seemed like a chapter of my life that was now closed and would never open again. The Korean War was over. Not that it did us much good, or the Koreans on either side of the DMZ. But it was over. So I went back to normal life. But listen, you don't realize how much it has scarred you, marked you, branded you. Then years later, maybe something bad happens. Like being accused of murder and sent to wait for the executioner on death row. It's like war again. All these years you've just been waiting for the other shoe to drop. And it does. Oh God, it does. When I escaped from that train wreckage, I knew I had been given a chance to survive. It was up to me to take it and to run with it. And I did. The way I made sense of it was to tell myself I was back in Korea. I'd screwed things up, and I'd been sent back. And I'm still in Korea. It's my Korea. I've learned to take care of myself. I've been in fights. I've survived accidents. I've learned how to lay low and stay low and keep moving. That's what's kept me young. I haven't had time to grow old. Being on the run, always one step ahead of the law, means I tread lightly. It means I don't grow old like other men. In the end, I've got to like this life. It's the life I've made, and I'll keep on this way, forever young. He smiled shyly. I do dye my hair, by the way. It's not naturally black. I went to see Frank Davis once or twice at the modest hotel where he was staying in the centre of town. The woman that ran the place, Marjorie Bowker, was always to be found at the front desk 
or else in the little kiosk shop she had next door to it. When I asked for Frank, I sometimes got to talk to her. She was a friendly woman in her late forties, and she seemed to have a very good opinion of Frank, being always ready to do him or his friends a good turn. I explained to her that Frank and myself worked at the same outfit, the cement works. She told me that her daughter Alana also worked there as a cashier in the canteen. Of course I remembered her. I saw her every day and I often exchanged a few words with her, as did Frank. Well, one morning when Frank had a day off and so did I, I called for him so we could go for a walk in town and maybe sit down for a coffee somewhere. When I got into the motel lobby, however, Marjorie stood behind the counter looking worried. I went over to her and said I wanted Frank. Listen, she blurted out, I just got a call from Alana at the canteen over at the cement works. It seems that there's a whole lot of OPP over there, looking around the place. They seem to be looking for Frank. Frank Davis? My God, why? One of the workmen talked to Alana at the canteen, she said, her voice shaking a bit. He said that one of the guys he knew had seen a photograph posted on an American TV show about wanted criminals, and it looked just like Frank Davis. There was a reward outstanding, too. So he decided to tell the OPP. Now they're over there. Frank isn't at work today, is he? No, he's here in his room, I suppose. I came to get him. Look, if Frank is in some kind of trouble, I'd like to help him. Do you know anything about this? Well, he has told me that he had a run-in with the law years ago. It seems he was able to escape then. And so he's been keeping ahead of the posse ever since, is that it? Seems so. God. He's a good guy, Marjorie. I know he's a good guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. Look, he needs to get out of town. How do we get him out of town before the OPP are over here too? Well, let's see, she said, picking up some papers behind her reception desk. There's a Greyhound bus leaving here at 11.55. That's just in half an hour's time. He could get on that. How do we get him to the bus station? Uh, he, he doesn't need to. The bus comes from there and then it stops here, just in front of the motel and the shops and the post office. There's a stop just outside the door. It always picks up a few people there. He could get a ticket from the driver. Okay, I said. I'll go down to his room and get him. I'll tell him to get ready. Meantime, I'll phone you from there and ask if the coast is still clear. Then I'll bring him out front. He can pay his bill, whatever he owes you, and then get on the bus. How's that? Okay, said Marjorie. He's in room 34, you know where that is, but you better hurry. So I went down to his room as fast as I could and knocked. Who is it? I heard him ask wearily from inside. It's me, I said. He opened the door when I went in. I took a deep breath before I talked to him. He looked at me, immediately sensing that there was something wrong. Listen, Frank, I said. Marjorie out front had a phone call from Alana at the coffee shop at the works. She said that the OPP, the Ontario Police, were there and they were looking for you. How could that be? he asked, taken aback. How do they know about me? It seems that somebody saw a photograph of you on some American TV show and recognised you. There was a reward, so they called the cops. The cops have obviously come to check it out. OK, he said shortly. That means I'll have to go, fast, because when they find out I'm not at work today, they'll ask where I live and they'll get this address. I'll pack up quickly. There's a way out the back. How do I get to the bus station to get a bus out of town? You don't need to, Marjorie says. There's a greyhound leaving for Toronto at 11.55. But it has to stop just outside the door of the motel here because it's in the middle of town. So you just have to walk out of here. I know it's a bit of a risk because you're out on the street and you could be seen. 
but it seems the best way. He nodded. Okay, he said again. I'll get packed. He went around the room, putting things into his battered old leather suitcase. I noticed it wasn't completely unpacked anyway. Then he went into the bathroom and got some things there and put them in the suitcases inside compartments. He got his coat out from the wardrobe. He looked in the mirror and straightened his tie. He looked at his watch. It's a quarter to twelve, he said. That gives us ten minutes before the bus comes. What does Marjorie suggest we do? Well, I said I'd call her from your room phone here and tell her when you're ready. If she sees that everything is okay out front, she'll tell me and we can go. Okay, he said. I dialed reception. Marjorie, I said, he's ready. How does it look right now? It's okay, she said. The coat's clear. No cops have come around and I see none out on the street. So he should come now. I hung up. All okay, I told him. So let's go. He picked up his suitcase and we left the room. We walked through the empty hallways towards the front of the house. I looked at Frank as we walked. He was bareheaded as usual and he was wearing a beige raincoat. It seemed a bit flimsy for the Ontario winter, but I suppose he had to travel light. We walked onwards. It seemed like an eternity to me. I suppose I was just very nervous. I started to think that we were in a complete labyrinth of hallways and we might lose our way and never get out. But finally we were walking through that door into the lobby. I went first and he followed afterwards. Marjorie was standing out there. She saw us and beckoned. He walked over to her at the desk. Thanks for everything, Marjorie, he said quietly with a trace of sadness and got out his wallet. This should cover my bill. He put some banknotes on the counter. Have you got enough money to get by? she asked. Yes, he said, I'm fine. She took the money and looked at him, her eyes brimming with tears now. Then she came out from behind the counter, walked across the lobby and opened the front door and looked out. Under the overhanging roof at the front of the motel, there were already a number of people gathered. Some had luggage and must be waiting on the bus. Frank merged into their midst. I stayed out there. Marjorie went back inside. After a few minutes, which seemed like an eternity again, the Greyhound bus lumbered around the corner and pulled up at the curb. The doors opened. Good luck, Frank, I told him, and we shook hands. You too, he said, and thanks for everything. You take care now. Then he boarded the bus, paid the fare, exchanged a few words with the driver and went and sat towards the back. He got a window seat. The motor of the bus revved. He looked out the window and waved. I'll never forget that look in his eyes and the shy smile. And then he was gone. The bus pulled out into traffic and headed for the highway. It was one of those goodbyes I'd got used to over here. A bus pulling out heading for the highway for God knows where. I pulled up the collar of me coat and went home to get lunch. Later in the day, I made me way back to the motel, went into the lobby and noticed that Alana and Marjorie were both there. They were behind the front desk, talking quietly. I went over to them. I looked around at the lobby myself. It was empty. Well, I asked in an undertone, did they come? Marjorie nodded. They eventually put in an appearance in mid-afternoon, about 2.30. Then it was much too late. She smiled slightly. What did you tell them? I asked her. I told him he had been staying here, but that he checked out this morning. Said he'd got another job somewhere and was leaving town. And that seemed to be enough for them. They knew they'd lost the trail. Oh, and they showed me a photograph of him they had. She took a puff on a cigarette she had lit. I told them it might be him, all right, but that his hair was different. Thanks, Marjorie, I said, and turning to her daughter, I said, Thanks, Alana. 
Good that you phoned your mom. That really helped. She nodded. Well, now we can just forget the whole thing, I said. But we won't forget him so soon, will we? Frank Davis, or whatever his name is. have been listening to A Life on the Run by Turlock on Me from 13 Tales Told Via Dubliner.